Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Carlos Guijuan Swine Disease Eradication Center Symposium. My name is Cesar Corso. I'm an associate professor at the University of Minnesota. And together with Dr. Monster Memorial, who is also a professor here at the University of Minnesota, we will be co-chairing this session. This year's SDEC symposium topic is on biosecurity in swine farms and how can we continue to improve our biosecurity programs. Before we begin, I would like to thank our SDEC partners for, for their support as it is key for many of our research projects. I would also like to draw your attention to the chat function on the right hand side of your screens. We would like to encourage you to type in your questions as we have set, up, set aside time at the end of the session for an interesting discussion. Our first speaker today is Dr. Daryl Holcomb. He is a professor in the Department of Veterinary Diagnostics and Production Animal Medicine in the College of Veterinary Medicine at Iowa State University. Dr. Holcomb received his DVM Master's from Iowa State University, and he currently focuses on biosecurity, disease risk, assessment, and economics of animal health and diseases. He'll talk to us about outreach investigations and how they can help us improve our biosecurity programs. Dr. Holcomb. All right. Well, thanks, Cesar and Monse, for uh, sharing this session, and, and thanks for the invitation to present uh, today to you. So what you're going to hear about uh, today from me uh, is, is basically uh, a presentation. I'm going to try to address these three questions. Uh, have investments in, in biosecurity been effective in the swine industry? Uh, why has making progress in biosecurity been uh, so difficult to sustain? And what can be done then to make sustainable progress uh, as far as biosecurity goes? So we'll start out with the first question there. And, and I think uh, the answer to that question is uh, yes and no. Uh, if we look at um, uh, the Swine Health Monitoring Project uh, uh, data here, this is a chart that's published each week in their weekly uh, uh, e-letter. Uh, we can see that uh, the cumulative annual, annual incidents, which is uh, what's represented on this chart, uh, one line represents each year, has really um, pretty much consistently been between 20 and 40 percent uh, every year. So about 20 to 40 percent of our swine breeding herds uh, have had outbreaks uh, in, in every year since uh, Bob Morrison started tracking this back in 2009. And uh, Cesar Corzo has done a nice job of, of continuing to track this. And so it's very useful information. But I, um, if you dig into this a little bit more, because it's, it's uh, starting to get a little bit harder to interpret these these charts with so many lines on them, but, uh, but if you dig in a little bit more, here's PD, 2013-2014 uh, down here. Uh, so it's actually had the lowest cumulative incidence of PERS outbreaks uh, that, that has uh, been tracked since they started doing this in 2009. Uh, but if you look at the two years before that, uh, you can see that the cumul cumulative annual incidence was, was actually pretty high. Uh, uh, the top uh, actually had the highest uh, uh, in the, 2011, 2012, and uh, and, and so there, you know, evidence there, uh, or what that suggests to me is that the industry responded to the crises that was uh, PED virus, and uh, there were some spillover effects. Um, it, it ended up reducing the incidence of, of PERS uh, outbreaks as well. Uh, and then, and then if you look at the next lineup, that's actually 20, uh, 2018, 2019. That's when African swine fever uh, hit China. And same thing, the industry kind of responded, not, not this time to a crisis, thank goodness, but uh, to the fear of the crisis. And, uh, and, and again, though, if you look at these two years before that, and so this would have been after PED, but uh, after uh, some time had passed, uh, the an annual incidence was, was back up there again. And so uh, the, the industry seems to, to um, be very good at responding, uh, improving biosecurity in, in, the, uh, in the face of a crisis or or in, in fear of the crisis, but, uh, but it does not necessarily, uh, or is not necessarily sustained over time. And so here, if you look at, uh, if you take out those three years sort of uh, after PED, after African swine fever virus, uh, those are the, the bottom three years there. Uh, those are either one or two years after, after PED or African swine fever in China. Uh, the end, we really kind of maintained uh, above 25%. Uh, every other year, the cumulative annual incidence is above 25%. All right, so why has sustaining progress been so difficult? Well, um, one of the, uh, uh, the observations I've made is that uh, as an industry, 
we seem to take a ready fire aim approach to making biosecurity improvements. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, when, when experimental research studies uh, that, that, you know, demonstrate that, that feed or insects or air can, can transmit PERS virus, uh, the whole industry kind of opens fire on those um, at one time and, and really focuses hard on that. And that's not necessarily the right approach um, because mainly uh, just because it can be transmitted doesn't mean it frequently is transmitted by those routes. And so not, not a critique of the, of the research itself. The research is important um, to, be, uh, to have that research done. Uh, it's more the industry's response to that research and, and what we do with it. And so a better approach then um, I'll, I'll suggest is a way that we can maybe sustain uh, progress in, in improving biosecurity. And, and the better approach I think involves identifying uh, first where farms are most vulnerable uh, to the introduction of pathogens. And, and to do that, what we, what we need to do is we need to look uh, for the hazards. We need to find out where those opportunities for the viruses to, to be introduced in the farm uh, occur. And those are, those are the hazards we're looking for. And, and we can use that information then to, to prioritize um, where, we, where we implement biosecurity control measures uh, to address those most vulnerable, uh, or those vulnerabilities. And so in, in, in doing it this way, then uh, it, it's really a, um, uh, a matter of identifying, you know, those most frequent routes. And, and so that's, I, I describe that as a ready aim fire approach. So rather than ready fire aim, it's ready aim. The aim part of that is, is of course, the, the identifying those ha hazards, uh, finding where the farms are most vulnerable, and then prioritizing those um, uh, uh, the control measures to address those. And, and that's really how we should be allocating resources um, uh, for anything, uh, biosecurity or, or otherwise, but uh, but that's uh, that's the approach that um, I'm going to talk to you about today here. And so, um, so so to address that, we've been been conducting outbreak investigations um, since 2013. We started started working on this uh, uh, in, in in earnest, um, and, and really I I found that uh, that's a very right after an outbreak. And again, this is back to how how we respond to crises. Uh, right after an outbreak, and if you can think of that as a crisis or, or uh, you know, we made a mistake, now we're in a crisis, that's really a good time for uh, both producers and veterinarians to, to sit down and try to figure out what went wrong, where was the mistakes, you know, and, and in the process, identify those, where those hazards lie in the processes uh, so we can identify those vulnerabilities. And so, you know, we're looking, want to look uh, really at all the steps in the process Processes. So, for example, how do we how do we uh, how do we uh, uh, collect uh, and produce, package, test, uh, deliver, and then enter semen? As an example, we want to look at all those steps in the process uh, so that we can identify potential hazards to see if there's there's a vulnerability there. And and so, the, an outbreak investigation is a good time to do that. Uh, producers tend to be very attentive at that time. Uh, veterinarians also, um, uh, you know, the pressure's on them to, to provide answers. And so outbreaks are good opportunities to learn from our mistakes, if you think of every outbreak as a mistake. Uh, but to do that uh, faster or better, um, just because we, we, have, uh, we make mistakes and, and have crises doesn't guarantee that we're going to learn from them. To do that better, though, we, I think, uh, have to use a more systematic and more comprehensive and more consistent approach. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about here uh, uh, in, in the rest of this presentation. And, and so the, the approach we use uh, really is kind of guided by this form. This is a, co a cover page to the form we use now. Uh, again, we started developing this back in 2013 with some, some funds from Iowa Pork Producers Association. And then we adapted it for uh, sw the Swine Health Information Center's uh, rapid uh, response program. And you, you can get access to this. It's, uh, if you go out to Schick's website, swinehealth.org, uh, you, you click on this emerging diseases link up and the first uh, item that shows up is the rapid response program. Uh, click on that and it, it'll take you to some links to some resources there, including this, uh, the investigation form here. So, and it's in a Word document, so it's editable. Um, you, can, you can use it as, as you see fit. And that form uh, is, you'll see if you, uh, if you get into it, is organized by what we describe as caring agent entry events. And so examples of those would be uh, entry of semen, entry of gilts, entry of employees. Those are all examples of caring agent entry events. Uh, in the past, I've used the term risk event. I'm trying to move away from that term uh, and, and prefer the term caring agent entry event uh, at the risk of confusing people that have, have maybe uh, heard me use that term before. 
Um, but but the, um, uh, the form that we use, if you, again, dig into that, has some closed-ended questions in each section. Um, those questions are, are there not to be used as a survey. In other words, we don't intend for you to go out and just read the questions and get the responses. Uh, when we do this, we, we do it in an open-ended fashion. And so we start out with very general questions. Uh, for example, tell us how you enter semen or tell us about the boar stud. And then we drill in to more and more specific questions. But the closed-ended questions are there to remind us then to cover uh, sort of all the specific steps in, in entry of semen uh, so that we can identify any potential hazards and, and make sure we address those. Um, at the end of this, uh, and, and this, this isn't necessarily in the form itself, this is something we do outside the form, but we have a risk scoring system that's, that's really a subjective uh, system uh, where we rate each carrying agent entry event uh, according to uh, the hazards that we found and the likelihood of each of those being responsible for the, uh, the uh, current outbreak that we're investigating. And so we give each carrying agent entry event a rating of uh, ranking, a rating I should say of high, medium, or uh, low. Um, and here, so here's the, uh, the um, uh, carrying agent entry events uh, for a swine breeding herd that we, uh, there's a section for each one of these in the, um, in the form. And what we found is uh, for roughly 90, 95% of swine breeding herds or sow farms in the U.S., this is a comprehensive list. So we don't find any other entry, carrying agent entry events other than what's listed on this slide. Um, for the other five to 10%, though, occasionally we do uh, run into herds that have some unique circumstances. So maybe an on-site feed mill, uh, have a couple houses located on the same premises or uh, some, some grain bins or that kind of thing. Um, and so we have some other uh, carrying agent entry events to explore there. And we, we will do those, uh, uh, those as well, but there's not a place in a form for that. This is just a screenshot here of kind of what one part of a page in that form looks like. This happens to be for uh, entry of semen into the farm or semen delivered to the farm here. And these are the potential carrying agents that come with that, uh, that semen or that carrying agent entry event. Uh, and then uh, following this would be, uh, uh, you know, start, well, I start with questions about the frequency and then, and then follow up with, with the other closed-ended questions. So to kind of give you an idea of what you you know what can be learned from uh, from that, uh, I'm going to present here uh, the rest of uh, the time I have uh, some some 19 cases that we did uh, for PERS virus um, between 2015 and 2017, and we investigated uh, all of those using uh, a form very similar to the one that uh, is out there on on Schick's website. Uh, it was adapted a little bit for that, but, uh, but it's roughly the same forms. And here's a summary then of uh, the uh, uh, 19 investigations. What we're summarizing here is the number of times we rated each of these uh, carrying agent entry events, uh, either medium and blue or red uh, is, is the number of times we rated up high. So what we got here is uh, have the, each carrying agent entry event ranked by the number of times we rated it high. And you can see that the top three here were uh, entry of on-farm employees, uh, removal of call sows, and repairs done inside the barns. And we don't normally go into these expecting that we're going to find a smoking gun, uh, but we, uh, we occasionally do find one where uh, a smoking gun, what we mean by that is, is, a, is a case where the, the evidence that suggests that that carrying agent entry event was, uh, was very likely responsible for the outbreak. And uh, you can never be 100% sure, but uh, sometimes we can get uh, fairly close to 100% sure. And so I identified those as smoking guns uh, here as examples. And, and so just note that you know, these repair events done inside the barns, um, uh, we had three, three of the 19 investigations that we did where we identified those as, as smoking guns. And so that's, uh, as I'll mention a little bit later here too, is, is a, in my mind, a, a very high risk event when those, those occur. Not, don't occur very often, but when they do, they're, they're uh, high risk. Um, and so I'm gonna give uh, uh, some examples here. I'm gonna tell these as kind of stories or uh, what I'll call hazard tales here later. Um, but I wanna just kind of walk through some of the things that we are, are um, uh, you know, learning from these investigations. And first of all, uh, employee entry, and this probably isn't new to any, uh, come as news to anybody, but employee entry is the most frequent carrying agent entry event that occurs. And, and that's been the case in every single investigation we've done. Uh, what I've got here is a word cloud of 
not the not the event itself, but the the carrying agents or of the potential pathogen carrying agents that uh, that that uh, uh, are are uh, a part of the the carrying agent entry event. So, for example, for uh, the uh, employee entry, uh, the potential pathogen carrying agents include the employee themselves, uh, employee lunches here, uh, and then employee vehicles here, and and again, all of those are. Um, taking up a big share of the total uh, potential pathogen carrying agents that are entering farms on a regular basis here. And so uh, again, that uh, the sheer frequency, the more often, uh, the more frequently something happens, the more opportunities there are for bad things to occur or for failures to occur there. Um, just generally, this isn't uh, specific to any single uh, outbreak investigation, uh, but, but what we find generally is uh, there's a lack of knowledge and control over what employees do when they're not at the farm. And so we see a lot of SOPs that, uh, that restrict employees from, for example, living with, uh, with other people that work on, on sow farms or restrict them from, from visiting or, or working on other sow farms um, or, or having show pigs and things like that. Uh, but the truth is, uh, you know, you can't, you can't track employees. You don't, you don't know what they're doing and you, and, and you truly don't have control uh, over what they do when they're away from the farm. And so that's something I think to always keep in the back of our mind. It's not, not necessarily a, a good news, but we, you know, you, you have to focus on the things you, you can control. And, and this, in my mind, doesn't seem to be one of those. Um, <clears throat> we see this in um, employees with other jobs. Uh, see this uh, more in small to medium-sized uh, production uh, companies where, um, you know, they may have employees that have, have, jobs, but uh, that job doesn't um, take up, a, it's not a full-time job, doesn't take up 40 or 50 hours a week, whatever they're working. And so in order to sort of backfill, they'll have those employees um, work on sow farms. And, and that's something we've run across uh, multiple times. And these are all examples on this slide of things we've seen uh, people who are working on sow farms uh, doing as other jobs, uh, usually within the same company, or I would say usually always within the the same company, I think, in these 19 cases. Um, but, you know, the one I've highlighted here at the top, I won't cover all these, but uh, we had one case where one of the employees on the South Farm also uh, chored at a, a wean to finish site. And it was happened to be a site within the same company. Um, but, uh, but they had been doing that for uh, a new batch of pigs here for a little over a month uh, when the outbreak in this South Farm occurred. And uh, so we went back and we happened to be able to, or happen to have uh, sequencing information for uh, both of these sites, the South Farm that had the outbreak we were investigating as well as the wean to finish site. And they were a nearly identical match. And so that was uh, pretty good evidence. We, we felt like that was pretty much a smoking gun. And uh, you know, that employee uh, did that for quite a while without causing an outbreak at the swine farm or at the South Farm. Uh, but eventually his luck ran out and, and it led to an outbreak there. Uh, this is uh, everything on this slide is actually from a single case. Uh, it was a farm that, that had some what I would describe as fairly dysfunctional uh, uh, employee relations, I guess. Uh, had a, a lot of evidence of, of disengaged employees that uh, uh, happened to be right uh, before the outbreak. The farm manager was tra uh, transitioning to a new job. Um, he, uh, he related some uh, information to us that, that suggested Several of the employees were, were pretty disgruntled. Uh, he, he had uh, claimed to have witnessed uh, some, some employees purposely violating, at least in his opinion, they were purposely violating some biosecurity procedures. Uh, and then a couple of them uh, on a day when, when the farm manager happened to be uh, gone, uh, they, uh, he kind of pieced this together after the fact uh, that two of these uh, employees on the South Farm had actually showered out in the middle of the day. Uh, went to another South Farm to interview for another job and then came back and, and showered in again and finished the day there. But, um, and, and this farm also had a, a very high uh, employee turnover, had over 100, generally over 100% had, had run that at that last few years. And so, uh, you know, you don't, this is, uh, as, as many of these I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you or show you today here, uh, they don't necessarily show up on a list of biosecurity practices that you should be implementing. Uh, but I would argue this, uh, this, this definitely warrants some control measures here, right? And, and it also highlights the importance of, um, of, of maintaining good employee uh, relations. Um, another one, uh, had employees um, uh, entering the barns, uh, employees are, well, the hazard, 
want to use this slide to remind everybody that that you know that these uh, employees themselves and things they bring with them are are particularly uh, higher risk uh, because they're in direct contact with the pigs. So we think about a lot of the potential pathogen carrying agents that might enter a, a farm. Many of those do not come inside the barn. So for example, feed trucks, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, things like uh, a semen delivery driver may not ever actually enter the farm, uh, but uh, things like employees uh, do, right? They come in direct contact with the pigs. So, um, you, you know, we saw a lot of cases uh, where they were allowing drinks and sometimes food inside the barns. Uh, and in 10 of the 19 cases, um, the employees were allowed to take cell phones, watches, and other personal items into the barn. And remember, this is 2015 to 2017. I think this has gotten better. This is one of the areas I've seen people seem to focus on a little bit. Uh, don't run into this very often where employees are allowed to do that, but, but at that time they still were. All right, and some other, a uh, few other hazard tales then I'll, I'll cover. Um, here's some, what I think are kind of some interesting stories and kind of again highlight the, uh, the importance of uh, trying to identify these hazards. Uh, this one I call the shared skid loader. And so the setup here was uh, we had a, a sow farm here uh, that had just had an outbreak of PERS. Uh, and then uh, you may have already noticed over here, it looks like a feed mill and that is a feed mill. That's um, a feed mill that, that actually milled feed for um, about three uh, other uh, swine farms, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, sow farms and all the downstream pigs uh, for this uh, production company. And, and then on top of that, um, you know, they had a maintenance shed over here and, and, and some other uh, outdoor storage. And, and so you can probably already start to identify a lot of hazards there. Uh, but the one I wanted to focus on uh, in this case was that um, located about here, this is where it would normally sit, it was this skid loader. And excuse me, the skid loader was used then to haul dead pigs and dead sows out of the barns uh, to this compost pile here. And they, they had on-site uh, composting to uh, deal with the dead pigs. Um, but then when that, uh, that skid loader, uh, of course, would, would probably only be used uh, for that purpose, maybe uh, a half an hour a day. Uh, when it wasn't being used for that purpose, then the owners thought it was a good idea then to go ahead and use that skid loader uh, over at the feed mill to, uh, to uh, uh, pick up any uh, spilled feed uh, or uh, things like that. And so, um, you know, that uh, hopefully you can, without me explaining uh, too much more about that, you can already uh, recognize the hazard there, the potential hazard. So it wasn't necessarily that we thought it would, uh, that it may, uh, or that it did contribute to the outbreak that occurred on the sow farm here. It could have, but we didn't really have any, uh, necessarily any evidence of that. Uh, but certainly you can see the hazard that it, that it, that it created uh, that put all of the other uh, sow farms and, and, um, and growing pig uh, sites uh, for this particular pr production company, put them at risk. And, uh, and so this was, a, this was a hazard. Again, you won't, you won't find this on any list of biosecurity practices, uh, but it was a hazard that um, needed to be addressed here. And in this case, um, uh, it took a while, but the owners were finally convinced to, to get a second uh, a skid loader. Uh, the next one is uh, what I describe as the poorly executed transfer. Um, this was a good idea. Um, it just didn't get executed very well, uh, but they had this uh, cart uh, here and uh, they used this cart uh, then uh, to haul uh, call sows from the, from the barns uh, out to the road where they would back up to a trailer uh, that that was then used to haul the call sows to the call plant. And, uh, and so again, a good idea. Uh, unfortunately, the cart was not washed between every load. Uh, and then um, on top of that, it, it got used to haul some gilts from an, an on-site gilt development unit to the gestation barn. So if you think about that a little bit, uh, uh, you know, you can, hopefully you can see that uh, the opportunity for this cart to get contaminated from the trailer uh, was there. In fact, we just recently did a, a study uh, with Chelsea Rustin, one of my graduate students, uh, completed this study as part of her uh, thesis work. Um, and basically what we did here was we put uh, fluorescent powder or glow germ uh, mixed with some wood chips at the back of a livestock trailer. Uh, we did this with marketing loads, but then um, uh, we, would, we would let them do their thing. Uh, we were actually looking, comparing conventional loading to a stage loading here, but in, in either case, it was very easy to see then how that, um, that fluorescent powder, which was simulating contamination, uh, was how easily it was uh, to, to get that track back into the chute. Uh, and then all the way into the alley of the barn. And, and this is, uh, happens to be a, a picture here right in the chute. Um, 
uh, and you can see how much uh, how much uh, fluorescent powder was in that that frame there. So, so uh, you know, there's no reason to believe that this, uh, or no reason to doubt that this cart is going to get contaminated uh, when it backs up to that to that shoot. So, or, uh, I'm sorry, up to that trailer. And so, there's if there's virus on that trailer that's going back and forth to the call plant, uh, I, I would bet money that eventually it's going to get um, get back to this cart. And then in this case, what they did um, a couple days after they hauled the uh, call sows uh, with it, they hauled a group of gilts from the GDU here, as I mentioned. And, and so that's uh, even adding more risk or is a greater hazard because now those gilts, if they got, uh, if they picked it up on the way over, now they're going, uh, being in, uh, directly introduced into the sow farm there. So the next one uh, called the replaced, the replaced feed line. Uh, in this case, it was a company owned uh, repair crew uh, went out to uh, uh, to fix a, a repair a feed line in the sow farm. Uh, had a damaged auger, some plastic uh, from a feed sack got uh, got wedged in it, and so th it turned out uh, that the auger that they used uh, the, inside the feed line to uh, repair that was transferred from an outdoor parts depot, and so it had it had uh, it had been uh, used or, or uh, uh, was on another uh, farm as part of a job there. It was left over, and so the the repair crews just dumped it out in this outdoor parts depot. Um, and, and to make matters worse, it was this, this outdoor parts depot was uh, located next to um, a house where some migrant employees uh, sometimes stayed. And so this was, this was something that the herd veterinarian uh, was not aware of. In fact, we had done about three uh, investigations for this company. This was about the, the third of, I think this would have been the fourth one. And, and every time we asked, uh, you know, the, the, are, are, are parts allowed or supplies or tools allowed to be transferred from one swine farm to another? Uh, and they were very adamant about that. Nope, absolutely not. Uh, did, did not happen. They just, but they weren't aware of this. And and so, the, um, once they did find out about this, then then uh, they did something about it. But but it's um, uh, these oftentimes the repairs and maintenance crews they they don't like um, to have a lot of light shed on them. So this was a case where again the the, the farm manager happened to be gone the day they did the repairs uh, as well. Uh, and then um, you know to to, to sort of. Uh, Top, uh, top, uh, put the icing on the cake here. Uh, the first clinical signs they observed, which were sows off feed, happened right in that same location uh, that they did the repairs about four days later. And so, um, this was a case where you know we thought was some pretty good evidence there. Uh, we we did end up calling this in a smoking gun. So, um, and then this uh, the repair events is is the most common smoking gun, as I showed you earlier. And again, it's just. These events don't happen very often, but when you really dig into how they, they happen, uh, they're, they're very high risk events. And, um, and so they do need, again, need to, need to implement some probably additional control measures there. This one I call the what, uh, what clean dirty line. Um, and uh, in this case, um, I'll kind of walk you through this diagram here. Uh, this is the entry, uh, employee entry, visitor entry as well. Uh, this is a door to the outside, so employees would walk into here. And then they would travel down here and, and, and go through one of these three uh, uh, showers. Uh, and so the shower was then uh, supposed to be established as the clean, dirty line here. Um, this happened to be a, a storage room uh, that had a door both to the outside employee entry as well as inside of the clean uh, office, clean side of the dirty line, clean, dirty line. Uh, and they stored uh, uh, cleaning supplies in there. And so uh, when we had initially uh, were talking about employee entry, we asked, uh, you know, do you, do you uh, periodically clean the, uh, the entryway? And, and they said that they did. And, and we could have just called it good at that point, but we dug into that a little bit more. And we found out then that the way they did that was that at the end of the day, uh, the employee that was uh, assigned to do that uh, would go through this door um, uh, and then get the cleaning supplies uh, here in this room and then walk into the entryway and they would would clean, do their job, and then when they were done, they would bring the cleaning supplies back in here, walk back to the office, and then shower out. Okay, and and so the you know there was a clear uh, misconception there, or 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 at least if they understood it, they didn't think it was important. But uh, you know there's really no clean, dirty line in that situation, and so uh, and so this was this was a good example again, um, uh, and they actually did uh, do this clean fairly frequently, and which is a good idea. But the the execution again was not. Not the best. And again, another example of something you'll not find on the list of biosecurity practices, but um, certainly uh, needed some attention. Uh, this one here I called the third party contracted repair crew. Uh, this was uh, a repair job done um, uh, inside barns, uh, happened about three to five days before they saw first clinical signs. 
uh, same kind of setup there where they, the clinical signs they observed were in very uh, uh, remotely or very close to the same location where the repairs were, were done here. Uh, this, in this case, the repair crew was not a, done by employees. It was a, a contracted uh, crew uh, that was not exclusive to the system. Uh, they had just done an, another job at a, a South Farm for another company right before this. Uh, they didn't shower in that day. Uh, and then and they also brought their tools and supplies uh, directly into the farm. Uh, the previous job that he had done, as I mentioned, uh, we, we were able later to track down a sequence for that uh, South Farm. Uh, it ended up being 99.8% similar to the one that caused the outbreak here. And, uh, and so in, in this case, uh, again, pretty good evidence there that, that that was the event that probably led to the outbreak. And then the unfortunately placed uh, a located liquid manure wagon. Uh, this was one that was a little unusual. I thought that we had a, a very old barn, a uh, 40 year old barn. Uh, it was not bird proof. Uh, happened to have a pretty severe rodent infestation right before the outbreak uh, occurred. And what had happened is this manure wagon, similar to the one in this picture, uh, that, that had not been cleaned or disinfected after the previous job, uh, was delivered and then parked next to the barn uh, for several days um, uh, just before the outbreak. So it was, they were getting ready to, to pump manure, but they, they didn't get around to it right away. And so what, what uh, made this interesting in this case was that the first clinical signs, uh, which again were sows off feed, uh, that the people in the barns noticed were right next to where this uh, this uh, uh, wagon had been parked. And and so normally you wouldn't, uh, here's another example of a carrying agent that doesn't come in contact or direct contact with the pigs and so, or the sows and the herd. And so we normally wouldn't get too excited about that. But in this case, uh, given the, the, you know, the, 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 how old the barn was and, and, um, and the rodent infestation, and, and there were lots of birds inside the barn, uh, then that, that, uh, raise this as a, as a hazard in our, our minds. And then this one I call the pregnant girlfriend. Uh, in this case, the company uh, had a policy that prohibited employees from living with people that worked on, on uh, other farms that were not owned by the company. Uh, but one of the employees that worked on the farm uh, that we were investigating had a girlfriend uh, that did work on another sow farm for another company. Uh, they didn't live together, so they didn't technically violate the, the policy. Uh, but she became pregnant uh, sometime before the outbreak occurred. And so, uh, you know, the likelihood, if you're concerned about cross-contamination, that was uh, probably probably a high likelihood there. And, and so, again, an example of our best intentions um, uh, to, try to try to control what people do when they're outside, uh, not working on the farm, but uh, those have limits. And then uh, the poor choice for semen delivery drop-off and pickup, uh, in this case, uh, uh, they, uh, the Borstead would deliver the semen to a drop-off point, and it happened to be inside this office here. Uh, there was a semen cooler in there, and then the farm managers, the individual farm managers or some other employee of each farm would come uh, down this road, public road here, enter the driveway and park over here, and then they would get out of their vehicles and walk uh, over here and get the semen. Uh, unfortunately, this was also a scales uh, that was used to uh, weigh uh, cull sows, uh, and they had a coal sow transfer station here. So coal sows would be delivered here, uh, and then a, another trailer would pick them up uh, and haul them to the coal plant. And after they picked them up, uh, they would uh, drive down this driveway and then weigh and then drive out to the public road here. And so lots of uh, crossing paths there, lots of opportunities. Uh, hopefully you can see the, uh, for uh, th these employees that are walking back and forth and driving here to get contaminated. Uh, and so in this case, the control measure was probably to find a, or was to find a different uh, location for that drop-off spot. All right, and then we'll wrap up here with uh, what I call the poorly contaminated or decontaminated uh, livestock trailers. Uh, here again, uh, good intentions. Uh, they were washing, uh, uh, disinfecting and drying uh, trailers between every load. Um, and, and they were even uh, monitoring uh, uh, disinfection uh, disappearance. Uh, and that all looked good. But when we, we dug into it a little bit more, uh, what, we, what we found out is they were applying uh, the disinfectant at half the target concentration, but they were applying it for twice as long. So it looked like they were using the right amount, uh, but, but they, uh, they, were, they were only, only because they were applying, uh, applying it twice, uh, taking twice the time. And so, uh, you know, you might, you might wonder, uh, does that matter? Uh, in the end, the same amount of disinfectant is going on that trailer. Uh, but it does matter because uh, when you put a, on at a lower concentration, uh, I guess uh, you're gonna, you can probably imagine that a lot of that just is going to run off, not going to maintain contact uh, with the surfaces that you want, uh, you want to disinfect. 
and then and then also it just has a different efficacy uh, at, at lower concentration so so applying twice as long is not uh, does not make up for applying it at half the concentration so that was a problem they, they needed to address uh, the other thing they were doing when we dug into how they were baking uh, they described as baking the trailers uh, is they would they, they told us they would get the target temperature up to 155 degrees and then hold it there for 10 minutes uh, but then when we, uh, again, dug in a little deeper, we found out that that was, uh, they were basing that off the ambient temperature, not the surface temperature of the trailer. And, and so we encouraged them to, uh, uh, to readjust how they were doing that. And so um, I just want to point out here, I, I think the, I saw an article the other day that ma the mash house were using these uh, uh, temperature indicators. They're just stickers that you can apply to a surface and they actually uh, will measure the, the surface temperature. And then uh, it just has an indicator when, it, when a target temperature is, is reached. So these are I thought was a good idea. All right, uh, and so in summary, then have investments in biosecurity been effective? Uh, yes, at times, uh, in, in the aftermath of, of, of crises or fear crises, um, they've been particularly effective, but uh, uh, we've not been able to sustain that progress uh, for, uh, for longer periods of time. Uh, and so what can be done then to make uh, sus uh, progress more sustainable? Uh, I think it does hinge on, on going out. Uh, I describe it, would describe it as hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, going out, trying to identify where the hazards are, and uh, doing it comprehensively, uh, looking for how the, uh, our style farms are vulnerable, and then trying to address uh, or prioritize control measures to address those uh, most significant uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Swine Health Information Center for funding, as well as the Iowa Pork Producers Association, and then again, thank the organizing committee for the uh, Alan D. Lehman Swine Conference uh, for the invitation to speak to you today. Our second speaker is Dr. Chelsea Rustin from Iowa State University. Dr. Rustin is currently working on her master's degree in veterinary preventive medicine at the Iowa State University College of Veterinary Medicine under Dr. Holcomb. Dr. Rustin will be talking to us about what we need to know about UVC chambers when introducing materials into pig farms. Dr. Rustin. Hi, I'm Chelsea Rustin. I'm currently a postdoc with the Swine Medicine Education Center at Iowa State. Um, and working on my master's under Dr. Daryl Holtkamp there. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about um, relying on UVC germicidal chambers to safely introduce materials into farms and what you need to know about it. So just to give you a little history on UVC light for disinfection. So it's actually reported um, to, its first use is actually reported as early as 1909 and it was used to treat water in France. And since then, it's had various um, applications for disinfection. So it's been used for air disinfection, water and wastewater treatment, laboratory disinfection, such as in the biosecurity cabinets or in the hoods in the labs, um, the food and beverage industry, and then um, medical applications in both um, human and veterinary medicine. And so there's a wide variety of literature available on UVC, but there's a lot of variation in terms of target pathogens, depending on the industry, um, wide variety of distances from UVC, UVC doses, depending on the pathogen and exposure times, and then a wide variety of UVC devices used as well. And so application of UVC light and livestock production, um, tip Typically, it's been seen on swine farms as well as in the poultry industry on those farms a little bit, but there's uh, very little literature or research done in these areas. Um, so kind of a gap that we need to work on. And so just taking a step back before we get into some of the literature and research that we did, um, just want to explain a little bit of the physics of UVC. Um, so it's split onto the wavelength of light and it's just before visible light. So um, about 10 to 340 nanometers is what you can see UV light as. And then it can further be split into four other sections. So you have vacuum UV, UVC, UVB, and UVA. And so typically UVB and UVA is what kind of gets through the atmospheres, can cause a little sunburn or some tans. And then you have UVC from 200 to 280 nanometers, and that's kind of has the germicidal effects. And so again, some properties. So it's disinfecting properties are from 200 to 280 nanometers. Um, peak germicidal effectiveness for DNA and RNA is approximately 260 to 265. Um, 
However, most lamps are usually around 254 nanometers, but this isn't a big deal. It's sufficiently close enough to the maximum and is effective. And there's research out there showing that. So. Um, some more about the physics or how it works. So UVC causes photodimerization of bonds in DNA and RNA. Um, so essentially it causes damage to those bonds, um, leading to thymine dimers within those strands. And this enables the DNA and RNA to be able to replicate. Um, so since it can harm um, DNA and RNA, and since we are made up of DNA, it can be harmful to humans, specifically their skin and eyes. So just something to keep in mind as well. And so just some things I'm going to go over today as well, some factors affecting UVC, and there's a lot that can kind of affect how UVC is working. So irradiance and time, distance and angle, microbial susceptibility, humidity and temperature are things you need to keep in mind, organic load, if that's present or not, um, surface reflectiveness and cleanliness of either the chamber or the room that you're using the UVC device in, um, surface type, so what material you're trying to disinfect, and then the UV bulb lifespan. And so irradiance and dose are the first thing that I'm gonna go through, because I'll use these terms a lot. Um, throughout the presentation. So irradiance is the UV arriving at a particular surface based on a specified area. Um, so it's a function of bulb intensity, distance, angle, direct and indirect exposure. And it's typically measured in milliwatts per centimeter squared. And then dose is what inactivates or kills the pathogen of interest. So this is actually a product of irradiance and exposure time. And so that's typically measured in millijoules per centimeter squared. And then other things affecting, affecting UVC is distance. So um, distance follows the inverse square law when we're thinking about UV light. And so this is um, saying that irradiance is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source. So as you double the distance, that surface area, surface area is going to get a quarter of that UV light irradiance. And so um, as distance increases, irradiance can decrease fairly fast. And so you can think about it as when you're driving at night and you see headlights really far away, they're kind of dim, not as intense. And then as they're getting closer to you and the distance is decreasing, it gets a lot more intense. So that's how I like to try to keep that in mind. Other factors are microbial susceptibility and doses. So there's study, there are studies published on swine pathogens concerning PERS, PED, and FMD. Um, however, the doses required for over a three log reduction in both PERS and PED aren't reported in these studies. And then there's also studies published on viruses, um, other viruses within the same family as some swine pathogens. Um, all the doses that have been reported in the literature for um, either viruses in the same family or the specific swine viruses have doses less than 150 to 190 millijoules per centimeter squared. Um, and this is essentially the average dose that's delivered by the commercially av available once chamber that you see a lot on swine farms. And I'll get more into that um, further into the presentation, how we measured that. Um, so my point here is though, that it's feasible to inactivate many swine viruses um, at the dose that's delivered by that UVC once box. There are, however, no studies on viruses within the same family or the viruses themselves, such as African swine fever, classical swine fever, um, actinobacillus pleuronemoniae, uh, brachiospire species, and mycoplasma high pneumoniae. So there are a little bit of gaps within the literature. Other factors to keep in mind, so surface reflectiveness. So within the UVC once box that's pictured here and what we used in the study that I'm going to mention in a couple of slides now. Um, so it has reflective surfaces all over its walls um, and ceilings. And you can kind of see that here to help be able to reflect the UVC light, and try to get more of those areas that might have a little less indirect exposure. There's also paint available. Um, that you can paint the walls of a room that you're using the UVC device, it's called Lumicept. And there is a study out there that shows its efficacy um, compared to a room that wasn't painted in this. And this is the paint we, uh, we used in the study that I'll talk about 
in a couple slides. Other things to keep in mind are humidity and temperature. Um, so relative humidity, so as UVC um, efficacy decreases as relative humidity increases. And then another study specifically looking at aerosolized PERS showed that UVC inactivation um, peaked between 25 and 79 percent relative humidity and then inactivation sort of decreased or did decrease after 79 after relative humidity increased um, past 79 percent and then below 25 percent. And then in that same study they looked at temperature as well, and they showed that the inactivation of um, aerosolized PERS increases as temperature increases from 15 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius. Other conditions to think about are direct or indirect exposure of surface air or water. Um, so, and here I have this little picture and you can see that it has a pretty smooth surface, but it has all these little crevices and things. Um, so keeping that in mind to what you're trying to disinfect. So obviously better to have a direct UV exposure to better disinfect that surfaces. So shadowing can be an issue. Um, and UVC also lacks the ability to penetrate most substances. So if you want to disinfect something, if you put it in a plastic box, um, essentially you're just going to be disinfecting the outside of that plastic box and not what you set in there and then what you're intending to. Um, really, there's only a few materials that UVC can pass through, quartz being one of them, and that's usually what the bulbs, the glass and the bulbs are made out of is quartz. Other factors affecting UVC would be type of surface. So um, one question that we were trying to answer with our research was, does UVC work on permeable and porous surfaces? So your cardboard boxes, a lot of these cloth or soft padded lunch boxes that you see people bring on farms are some things that we wanted to look at. Um, doing a little digging with what's available in the literature, the food industry has done a lot of research on um, UVC and its ability to disinfect surfaces of fruits and vegetables and meats and processing plant countertops. And so they obviously targeted um, foodborne pathogens and most of them were bacteria. And a majority of those studies actually found that UVC had a higher efficacy on smooth, even non-porous surfaces of those produce and meats. And they often found the, the rougher or um, more uneven those surfaces were, were or any like fruits and vegetables that had little crevices, those, they actually had a more difficult time um, trying to inactivate things on those surfaces versus those fruits and vegetables that might be a little more smooth. And then another factor affecting UVC is um, organic material. And so that's another question that we wanted to answer with the research that I'm getting to here is, does the presence of organic material on surface inhibit the efficacy of UVC? And so um, human medicine actually has looked at this quite a bit. And so they specifically are looking at bacterial loads on surfaces in healthcare facilities um, and in the presence of organic material or not as well. And a majority of these studies found that organic loads to some extent, approximately around five to 10% organic load, had some level um, of decrease in efficacy of microorganisms to UVC. And that brings me to the swine industry and what research is available. So there's actually very limited research on UVC um, on surfaces in the swine industry. Um, so within the past two years that I've been here, um, I did a study evaluating the efficacy of UVC for inactivating Seneca virus A on different contaminated surfaces commonly found in swine farms under challenge conditions. And so the surface types we chose to use um, were ones that we felt um, were really representative of uh, materials that people usually bring on to swine farms. So cardboard, such as permeable vaccine shipping boxes that you might bring on. Um, plastic, so supplies or lunches that come in can, plastic containers or Ziploc bags that you pass through the UVC box or into a supply entry room, and then cloth, 
Um, so what we were kind of targeting here were those permeable soft-sided lunch bags that I had mentioned previously, because you see a lot of people carrying those on and putting those through the pass-through box as well. So we cut these materials into about three centimeter diameter circles. Um, and then the challenge conditions we did were with or without feces, so trying to see that organic load if that decreases efficacy, and then on the top or bottom surface. And so what I mean by that is, um, and with, in a lot of these chambers, you'll see kind of a wire graded metal shelf that you can put things on. So with the top or bottom surface, I wanted to see if that was gonna block any of the pathogens from the UVC and if it blocked enough to have a significant pathogen load still. And so we use the commercially available pass-through chamber um, by, and so it's the BioChip pass-through germicidal UV chamber by once. Um, it has a clean and dirty side door. So when you're coming into a breeding herd, you can set your lunch in, go and shower on the dirty side and then go and shower and come out in the office and grab the disinfected things on the clean side and also has a lot of safety features included as well. So it has the um, ability, or it's not allowed to open while it's running or it has an emergency stop. So you can click that if you need to, for whatever reason, get in there, shuts the UV lights off and so you can retrieve that object. And so this is just a picture of the inside. So it has a, approximately a 20 by 20 by 20 inch interior, has about or approximately four 18 inch um, UVC bulbs located at each corner of the chamber, I pointed out here, and then the single graded metal wire shelf that's approximately one inch um, from the UVC chamber or the bottom of the UVC chamber. Uh, the second um, area we wanted to test was a supply entry room um, that people bring supplies in um, on swine farms. So we built an eight by eight by eight foot room um, to simulate a su supply entry room. And then we try to set, up, set it up really similar to the pass-through box that you saw. So we had a um, graded metal wire shelf in the center and it was approximately four feet high. Um, we utilized ESP Deluxe UVC units that are made by Elevated Health Systems. Um, they usually these are more utilized in human medicine and so we had four of those um, in each centrally located in each corner of the room and you can see those there. Um, the walls and ceilings were painted with the UVC reflective paint, that Lumistep that I had mentioned earlier, and then we set the replicates of the coupons here um, try to center it in between the UVC units and then we measured irradiance with this UVC meter, which I'll get into in a couple slides. As far as exposure time, so for the pass-through box here highlighted in orange, um, we use the exposure time set by the manufacturer um, and that's about five minutes. We did do some digging um, into what dose we wanted to or minimum dose we wanted to get to. So we wanted to get to 41 millijoules per centimeter squared. And this was based on estimates for poliovirus one, which is in the same family um, as Seneca virus. And so um, as you can see, based on our calculations and the irradiance that we measured, we got on average about 150 to 190 millijoules per centimeter squared. So well above that minimum dose that we are trying to achieve. And as far as the supply entry room, um, we obviously didn't have a manufacturer uh, to set the times for this. So we wanted to do something that would be practic practical. And so we did two hours, so 120 minutes. Um, and we based this again off of what was practical in the dose calculation I had mentioned earlier uh, to try to achieve that minimum dose of 41 millijoules per centimeter squared. And as you can see, we got well above um, that dose with the 650 to 750 millijoules per centimeter squared. And so I keep mentioning these UVC meters that can measure irradi irradiance. And so this is what we use, this UV 254 SD. Um, it's about $600. There's many types of UVC meters available and they can range anywhere from the $600 shown here up to a thousand or well over that. And so um, 
what this guy has is two probes here. Um, they actually have one for UVA, but we obviously use this guy here for UVC. Um, it hooks in to this, and then there's an SD reader. And so what it actually records is your irradiance, like I said, and then you can have it recorded every 30 seconds, every five seconds, um, and there's a range of seconds that you can um, record that on. And so this was for the supply entry room. We had it recorded every 30 seconds. And so you can see that it takes a little bit for these UVC um, units to kind of warm up to peak irradiance. So as for the study procedures, we prepared the surface of the coupons by um, adding two mils of virus and either one mil of PBS or one gram of feces. We allowed them to air dry for approximately 90 minutes and then we place them in the UVC chamber or room um, for the designated times. And then for virus recovery, we used three mils of PBS and we eluded the surface of those coupons about 10 times and kind of scratching the surface as well to try to suspend any uh, cells and virus and then collected that um, liquid and then we centrifuged that and performed virus isolation and titration. And so for the results, so when we are looking at the top versus bottom and whether the shelf was blocking any of that UV light, we actually found there was no significant difference um, in viral reduction between the top and bottom inoculated groups. Um, so this is suggesting that the uh, graded metal wire shelving units used in this study in both, both in the pass-through box and the supply entry room did not block a, a significant amount of surface area of those coupons to um, make more pathogen load available on there. And then when we looked at the UVC treated groups versus the positive controls, um, I'll show you what we found, but first I'm going to kind of orient you to this bar graph because it can be a little busy. Um, so on the Y axis, we have the virus titer, and then on the X axis, we have the three different materials we use, as well as the groups with PBS and feces. And so you'll have the positive control with PBS um, first, and then it's comparison of the UVC treated with PBS and virus, and same for the feces for each material. So positive control with feces first, and then the UVC treated um, with feces for comparison right next to it. And so we did find that there were statistically significant differences um, within all groups. However, what I really want you to hone in on and what's most clinically significant in this case is that the only group that had over a six log reduction of uh, Seneca virus was on the plastic with no feces. All other groups still had a pretty heavy um, virus titer um, remaining on the coupon after UVC treat treatment. And same thing, pretty similar thing for the supply entry room. So we did have that statistically significant in a lot of the different groups. However, the only clinically significant one would have been this plastic with no PBS. And so um, again, inactiv inactivating over a six log reduction of the virus on that coupon after UVC treatment. And so just some conclusions. Um, so UVC effectively inactivated Seneca virus on plastic surfaces with no feces in this study in both the supply entry room and pass through chamber. Um, the metal wire shelving used in this study did not appear to interfere with the UVC treatment and UVC did not work in the presence of feces or on the permeable surfaces such as cardboard and cloth. And so just some applications or some take home messages for um, everyone is that um, UVC can be utilized when you want to have a physical disinfection, not chemical. So for situations or objects where um, maybe a wet or chemical disinfection is not desirable. So like cell phones, um, things like that. And then I also want to mention that it is environmentally safe too. So there's not a ton of ozone or anything that's produced from having these UVC lights on either. Um, and then just some on-farm applications. So um, it can be really effective for some past, 
pass through items such as eyeglasses, watches, phones, lunches in plastic bags or plastic containers, um, anything that has a non-permeable kind of smooth non-porous surface would be really good to pass through that. Oops, sorry. And then um, other on-farm applications. So um, getting back to the supply entry room, although we showed that it did work on the plastic with no PPS in our supply entry room scenario. Um, there are, I guess practically on farms, there's a lot of variation in services that are entered through um, the, su the supply entry rooms, and this may limit application of UVC. And I just kind of want to leave you with this question as well. Um, so um, thinking of how we do disinfect items, whether you use UVC or some chemical disinfectant, what truly does work for items with per permeable surfaces like boxes or cloth? Um, and I'm not sure if we really know that yet. And so just in general maintenance, how I mentioned later or earlier of the bulbs needing clean regularly. Um, so dust and oil can build up on these bulbs and this can block UVC light as well and make it less um, efficacious. So you wanna wear gloves so that the skin from your oils um, doesn't get on the bulbs and can block light. Use an alcohol-based disinfectant to lightly wipe off um, any dust or oils on those bulbs. And the same thing for the chambers um, with reflective sides as well um, should also be cleaned. And then you also need to change the bulbs regularly and then monitor that UVC intensity. So these um, chambers are not something that you can just build or buy once and just set it there and it works, it's magic. You, you really gotta keep up on maintenance. And so changing the bulbs are really dependent on the use, so the number of cycles that you run these. Um, and for example, the pass-through chamber that we used in our study and that are widely used on farms have five minute cycles. And so you're not just turning these bulbs on for a long period of time and then turning them off, you're having short spurts of turning these on. So every five minutes they're powering on then powering off. And so this can actually reduce the lamp life to about 4.2%. And so what I mean by that, so generally if the bulbs have 8,000 hours, um, of life in them, this can be reduced to 336 hours or 4,000 4, five minute cycles. Um, so you have to keep that in mind too. So how many employees you're bringing on farm, how many times you're powering that on um, in the morning when you're passing supplies through or throughout the day. And so it's suggested that a minim <clears throat> at minimum, replace the bulbs and ballast once a year um, or every six months or every 1,000 cycles. And again, that's just gonna depend on how many times you're running that. And then some safety considerations, of course, too, I mentioned that it's damaging to DNA, so it's dangerous to humans or animals, uh, specifically to eyes and skin, so it can cause burns. Um, I've heard some stories of veterinarians that have some of the homemade UVC chambers on farms and they looked into the UVC light with a door open and they actually <laughs> affected their eyesight for about 24 hours or so. So use caution, make sure there's proper training of personnel using um, the UVC. Uh, make sure there's complete enclosure if, they are, if it is a homemade box so you don't want any leakage of light from the chamber um, and have the, the risk of exposing um, people's eyes or skin. Um, and then also safety features are um, important too. Um, to have built in there. So if you open the door, the lights shut off or you can't open the doors when it's running. Um, and then having glass windows, if you are gonna have a window um, to make sure that that UVC light can't penetrate through that. And other considerations, again, just honing in that if there is any organic material, wipe it off. Um, don't place items the items that you want to disinfect in containers um, because UVC most likely can't penetrate that material. And then do not pile items into the UVC chamber because um, this is gonna block surfaces from coming in contact with the UVC light. Um, so if you're stacking a bunch of lunches in there, um, you're essentially only probably gonna get those top surfaces of those lunch bags. And I just wanna um, refer back to kind of this statement, so your block surface, there's no UVC contact and it's not going to be disinfected. 
And I'm just going to leave you with this then. Um, this is kind of a mnemonic that's the Swine Disease Eradication Center from University of Minnesota came up with for UVC and it's no PERS, so um, new bulbs, so change your bulbs regularly, organize routine cleanings of your chamber <clears throat> and bulbs, um, place items in direct exposure, rotate the items if you feel like one surface was blocked and you want to get more direct exposure, um, make sure you have reflective sidewalls within that chamber, and then also always keep in mind safety um, for personnel using this. And so I just want to give some acknowledgments to the Swine Health Information Center and IPPA for funding some of the UBC workshops and projects. Um, once in elevated health systems for um, contributing the equipment for us to use for research. And then Dr. Daryl Holtkamp is my major professor at Iowa State and who I've done a lot of this research under. And then the Swine Medicine Education Center for helping out with the projects. And thanks for listening. Our third speaker this morning is Dr. Cassie Jones from Kansas State University. Dr. Jones is an associate professor in the Department of Animal Sciences and Industry, where she focuses on understanding the role of feed as a potential vector for viral transfer to pigs. She'll talk to us about the role of feed in disease outbreaks, showing us experiences from Manhattan, Kansas, Vietnam, Brazil, and beyond. Dr. Jones? Well, hello, and it's my pleasure to visit with you about the role of feed in disease outbreaks and share with you some of our experiences over the last year from Kansas, where, where I'm coming to you from today, um, as well as Vietnam and Brazil as, and how we see potentially some of those learnings being extended into your facilities or your operations. As we get started, I want to first describe a little bit about our environmental swabbing procedure. And I promise that I'm not going to overwhelm you with information, but I also know that as we go through the rest of this presentation, um, I'll have questions that kind of come back to, well, how did this go about? Or how did you actually collect these samples? And so because of some funds um, from SHIC, from the Swine Health Information Center, um, we validated this environmental swabbing procedure that we've really translated originally starting from the pet food and human food industry and validated that for um, environmental swabbing and analysis of pathogens within different um, feed mills and different swine farms. And so what all three of the, the uh, procedures that I'll be describing today or all three of the projects have been using the same environmental swabbing procedure. And so they rely on these um, surgical sponges. I cause them kind of, I call them kind of gauze um, pads. And so we start with 50 milliliter conical tubes and these um, four by four um, gauze pads. And then we add 25 milliliters of phosphate buffered saline in and roll up the surgical sponges or these gauze um, pieces and put them into the conical tubes. And that um, those, those conical tubes, we always prep those while we're in gloves and in a sterile environment. And then it makes kind of a really nice environmental swab. When we're swabbing, we try to stick to um, just about, uh, just, just shy of a square meter area. Um, and in many times we'll use templates um, in order to make sure that we're standardizing that location and that size so that we can um, help understand the consistency or maintain consistency of any like pathogen prevalence and, and quantification that we might find. That said, we can't always have a template. Um, when we're using something like a floor of a warehouse, we certainly can. But when we're looking at truck tires or other surfaces, we just can't get that template down. And so we, we try to estimate the best we can. And then when we're finished swabbing, we roll that um, gauze back up and um, return it to the conical tube and send that entire tube for diagnostic testing. Upon arrival at the diagnostic laboratory, they then squeeze out um, that sample and extract it out um, and just have a few microliters that they, can, that they can ultimately use for PCR analysis. And so that's ultimately all of the results that we'll be sharing with you today are really based on um, quantitative real-time PCR um, or in the case of, um, uh, 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 and that's actually in the case of all of our projects that, that we'll be talking through today. And so um, that's just the results that we request, request from the diagnostic laboratories that we're working with. 
All right, so today I'm going to talk through kind of three main different disease outbreak investigations, um, starting with one that fell a little bit too close to home for us. And so I'll, um, last year at the Lehman Conference, I shared a little bit of our learnings from our PEDV outbreak at our home farm at K-State, um, at our swine teaching and research farm. And I'll, ex I'll extend and, and explain further some of those findings. I'll also talk about um, some outbreak investigations that we did internationally this year. And um, one was in the southern part of Brazil, and the second was with a production system, and it's still ongoing, that's struggling with African swine fever virus in Vietnam. So to begin with, um, the Kansas State University Swine Teaching and Research Center, which is where we do the predominant amount of our teaching and research activities for the K-State Swine Applied Swine Nutrition Team, um, we suffered a PEDV outbreak in March of 2019. Um, no, there there were two other sites that showed no evidence of infection, and so we have kind of two um, affiliated sites that had no evidence of infection, and the feed mill contained no evidence of PEDV, and that was really important for us as part of that process. Um, just a little bit of background, the K-State Swine Teaching, Swine Teaching and Research Center is a one-site fair to finish operation. We have four groups of sows and five groups of nursery and finishing pigs. So the way that the unit is set up is on um, um, the far left, we have a west finisher, a relatively old facility, um, and then we have our primary finishing barn um, um, just to the right of that. Um, we have our office, which is really our main transition area, and then along the right side of the fenced-in perimeter, we have our nursery, farrowing, and then a separate breeding and gestation barn. The entire area is completely fenced off with the only entry points being through the office or there being a central driveway between the west finisher but again not very many people know about that and that's for predominantly um, animal unloading or loading as well as manure um, manure receive or manure traffic Historically, we've been fortunate to have a really high herd health. Um, we eliminated PERS in 2000. We use an off-site SEW nursery as a wean gilt isolation facility, and we've actually had seven different sources of gilt in the last 20 years. Prior to um, 2019, we had no coronavirus infection of any kind, so no TGE or any other coronaviruses, and really virtually no adverse health event in almost 20 years. And then we um, got the wonderful call in 2019, actually while we were at the Midwest American Society of Animal Science meetings, um, that, uh, there were, that there was diarrhea in some of the, some of the sows. So before I get there, I want to talk about what biosecurity looked like at our swine teaching and research facility. This is a teaching and research farm, and so on average, we have a um, 100 students um, or 100 or so different people every week in and out of that facility. Um, in order to maintain that high level of health, pigs, semen, and then people in supply movement are all controlled by crossing that perimeter. So for example, those gilts are quarantined in isolation like we talked about. Semen delivery is to a cooler in the office, not directly into the breeding barn. Market pigs are shuttled on a farm trailer to a truck outside the, par the, the perimeter zone. All supplies crossing the perimeter and are insured to have come from pig-free zones. And people change into clothing through transition zones in the office. And so all of those were in place prior to our PEDV outbreak. Just to give you a little bit better understanding understanding perhaps of what this looks like and, and how people um, would utilize our facility um, and, and enter it is that we have a driveway kind of over here on the outside of the facility, the facility perimeter, and there's also a student apartment there, but again, only accessible outside of that perimeter. Then you can walk along a sidewalk along um, the south side here, you walk along um, the east side and enter into the our entrance door. At that point, there's a bench and um, that you sit down and it's a Danish entry system. So all outside shoes are left in that entrance area. You swing over and then um, we have a three phase shower area where we have um, derobing um, a shower area and then fresh change of clothes in this area so that we have um, no potential for cross contamination there. Let me go back to my 
10. So as we enter the facility, that's where our bench is and we have a swing over um, so that only socked feet are allowed on the other side. And then again, a three phase shower area where we have um, our outside clothes and then a central area for the shower and then the inside the farm clothes and coveralls located after that. The research objective of this project was to use environmental monitoring to evaluate biosecurity risks on a farm experiencing a viral outbreak in an adaptive design. And so we wanted to really just use environmental monitoring to help us understand what's working and what's not working. And so it, we started to see our initial signs of disease. Um, we call this day negative three. In weaned pigs, we had some, we had scours, and that was our initial sign that, that there may be an issue. And so samples were collected and on days zero, feces did test positive for porcine epidemic diarrhea virus. At that time, we implemented phase one biosecurity changes, and I'll talk through what those are in a moment. Then we collected environmental swabs on day 14, just to see how our biosecurity changes were being implemented. Again on day 18, and because of those changes, because of those results on day 14 and 18, we made some additional changes to our biosecurity. We added a second washer and dryer on day 42 in response to some additional swabs that had been collected. And finally, I'll show you um, hopefully our success story, our mostly negative farm on day, uh, on day 230. And so I'm going to walk through this and really explain some of these biosecurity changes. Um, as I get started on that, the, the locations where we collected these samples really divided into four different key areas. The first would be pig contact areas within barns. And so that would be, again, these are environmental samples. They would be the floors, um, the penning, waterers, feeders, um, but also, um, you know, when we're going through a viral outbreak, that's where we would think to collect most of our samples would be from ropes or from within the area of the pigs themselves. However, we also looked at non-pig contact areas or surfaces within barns. And so the hallways and walkways, the benches, um, the door handles. We also looked at outside barns and inside offices. As you can see, we have a central office where our farm staff would come back for lunch, where they would come back and do any paperwork. And then we have our transition areas, such as that shower area in and out. And then we did end up putting some transition areas in each of the barns that I'll talk through as well. So I'm going to initially start with what this looked like upon our initial swabbing. We had, um, that we had, um, initial clinical signs of disease followed by a po positive test and so that led us to implementing some specific phase one biosecurity changes. So the new changes were that we prohibited non-employees from entering the facility. Again remember we had about a hundred people in and out of the facility any given week and so we shut that down. All student traffic had to be minimized at that point and so we only had three people going in and out of the facility during the during this time. We also segregated employees to farm areas. So for, for example, we have a finishing facility manager, um, one employee that manages mostly the farrowing and nursery area, and one who's mostly in charge of breeding and gestation. And so we kept those individuals only going to their, their specific barns and back. There was no cross traffic. Um, so they were segregated to their farm area. And then we had clean coveralls going into each room. And so employees were, were required to change into new coveralls um, as they entered into any barn and before going into any new room, hoping to try to prevent any additional spread of disease. And we also implemented a feed transfer protocol. From some of our previous research, our biggest concerns were having a contaminated feed mill and what that potentially could do to other affected sites or other sites that could potentially be affected, and also just how difficult that is to remove from a mill. And so we really prioritized not um, having farm to mill transmission, and so we implemented that feed transfer protocol. The biggest challenge with this is that we have this fenced perimeter of our facility, but all of the feed bins are inside the buffer zone. And I would say that that's probably the case for most facilities, most of, most of our production facilities. And so our feed mill, is, of course, is located off site and about two miles um, to the south of, of our farm. And so historically, we would have a feed mill that could come in our driveway, go through and, and through this gated area, and then go to each of the individual barns and deliver feed. That was disallowed during this case, and so 
what we did instead is we implemented a feed transfer zone. So we had an extra feed truck. Again, I know that that's not something that's altogether common, um, but we had two feed trucks that um, we use in our, our um, feed delivery through our farm or through our, through our mill. Typically one of those is a medicated and one is a non-medicated feed or one can have ruminant ingredients and one um, can have non-ruminant containing ingredients. Um, but in this case, we decided to have one become a dirty truck. And so one of those trucks came to the inside of the feed um, and to the inside of the farm. The other was our primary feed truck that was um, the newer one, of course, that had more volume, and that was the one going back and forth to the feed mill. And so the inside feed truck never left the farm grounds after um, its arrival. And so we would shuttle feed from one truck to the next, and then once inside um, that feed truck within the farm perimeter, it would deliver to these different facilities. Again, that's very much overkill, but we wanted to maintain and prevent any potential transmission back to the mill. Other things that we did during this time, we would um, then quarantine the truck that was delivering the feed. Um, we would clean, wash it, sanitize the outside, and collect samples and wait for those PCR samples to come back negative before it would be allowed to go back into the feed mill. Again, I know that that seems extreme, but again, but we really did not want um, our mill to become contaminated with porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, as that would cause a lot of long-term headaches and issues for us in the future. So that's how we how we manage that one. As I get started talking through some of the data, I'm going to just orient you a little bit about these types of maps. We chose to employ a heat mapping for this. And so first, um, the fenced perimeter would be this light blue line that's around. Um, any of the gray area would be vegetation. So that's kind of grass um, or dirt. Um, the light gray areas would be our primary driveways or walkways from one area to the next. And then our buildings are outlined in the dark gray areas with doorways or transition zones designated by um, dotted lines. So starting over here with the West Finisher, we just really have one main entry point to that facility. Facility. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then we have our primary finishing barn. Um, we created this transition or entry zone um, for employees to enter and change into their clean coveralls there. And then we have four rooms within that finishing barn. We have a couple of shops, our primary office area with the two feed trucks, um, one that could go back and forth to the feed mill, and then employee vehicles would be parked outside the farm perimeter. We do have a tractor, the inside um, the feed mill feed truck, and um, just a, a general pickup, a general use pickup um, that are all located on the inside of that fence perimeter. perimeter. And then we have a grower, farrowing, nursery, and another nursery, as well as breeding and gestation. And so each of these areas, like here on the grower, um, where there is that, that square, that's where we have a transition zone so that people can walk in to that, that um, building at that location. And then there is a Danish entry style bench there for people to change into clothes and change footwear with, when they're leaving um, the outside area and into that farm. And so those transition areas or those doorways are really where we have primary entry points into our each of our different um, farms and, and, and into each of the different barns. Um, the office itself is also a point where we were looking at because that's where we have entry and exit of all employees and of all workers. Um, it's also where we have the greatest opportunity for cross traffic between people that might be working and breeding and gestation or the nursery and farrowing or the finishing facility. Okay, so we implemented these changes and then we wanted to have a pretty good understanding of where, where are we at, how far and how widespread has, has the virus gone. And so we took our initial swabs on day 14, so two weeks after we got the initial PEDV diagnosis. And so at that point, we were still trying to manage animal care, we're still trying to manage sow groups, um, but this is what the initial swabs um, demonstrated at this point, we were anticipating that we would see um, PEDV in pig contact areas, but we were hoping that we would not see um, PEDV being brought into non-pig contact areas. And these were ultimately the results. Um, I have added, again, like a heat map. Um, a green would be if we collected a sample and none was detected. Yellow means that we had a, a CT between 35 and 40 orange between 30 and 35, and a red area demonstrates or designates an area that would be less than um, 
30, and so a relatively hot area. Again, most of our signs of clinical disease started in the nursery, and so we got some positive um, some, some positive PCR results on day 14 of pigs that were still in the nursery, not a surprise. What was perhaps a surprise is that we were starting to track that into the other nursery as well as into the transition into the farrowing area. Likewise, um, in our transition zones that we were trying to keep clean, we saw positive PCR in those um, transition zones. We also saw positive PCR at very high levels in the walkway in the central area between rooms of our finishing area. So there's no pigs in this area right now. Um, and our transition zone again had been contaminated. Perhaps the most concerning um, aspect for us was what we found when we surveyed the office. So unsurprising, the feed truck, um, two of the tires were, were clean, two of, one of the tires was dirty and the inside of that feed truck um, was positive, but the feed mill feed truck that was going back and forth to the feed mill remained negative, showing that our feed transfer protocol was really working to keep that feed truck clean at least. But again, in the office, we were hoping that we would not have any PEDV identified at that point we had high levels of it in every swab we collected. Um, we had positive PCR. And what's most concerning of anything is that that included that it was being brought out of our transition zone. So remember, this area is our three-phase shower. And so we were perhaps not surprised that we had some tracked into the office area itself. But the fact that we found positive PCR past the point of changing clothes and at this point showering out had some really substantial um, concerns that in our entry area, which we would consider to be outside the perimeter zone, we had a positive PCR showing that we were at risk for moving this out of our farm and potentially into other sites. And so those transition zones were our most concerning areas um, as we moved those then into the office. And ultimately our highest risk of concern or highest risk is that area prior to the Danish entry system on the outside area where we would keep our outside shoes um, and that those were, that was a contaminated area. So then we followed up on day 18. We did some pretty intense cleaning and sanitation between day 14 and 18. And we said, this is a problem, so let's clean it up. And so we collected samples again on day 18 um, after we had gotten those results and got a broader and better understanding of where that contamination may lie. So these samples, again, were not taken in, in any of the farms or any of the barns themselves, but only in the office and in, and in employee vehicles. Again, some pretty concerning things here. The good thing is that our primary transition zone um, was finally clean, and so it was PCR negative after quite a bit of cleaning and sanitizing, um, but the student apartment was positive, and we found positive PEDV P PCR, and again, that is outside the perimeter, outside the fenced perimeter. The other concerning thing is that when we swabbed um, student graduate student cars, that there, were, there was positive PCR found in graduate student cars as well. And so that led us to implement phase two biosecurity. Phase two biosecurity included boot covers and gloves worn prior to the entrance, coveralls over scrubs when going into a new barn. Um, we created these Danish entry style benches um, for each of these transition zones. And ultimately we worked a lot on teaching biosecurity concepts. And so teaching people and our farm employees using things like glow germ and UV light so that they could see how those benches worked and really, really working to implement and survey them. So as we implemented those, we slowly over time, even though we still had positive animals on site, we were slowly resolving some of those challenges um, with our next hotspot being then where we were cleaning coveralls. And we continued to have challenges with coveralls and cross traffic of how do we get these coveralls clean. So ultimately, um, when we still continued to struggle within our transition zones, we implemented and purchased a new, um, a new washer and dryer located that within the clean area. And after we implemented that second washer and dryer, subsequently most of our um, swabs on site became negative. All of our office swabs have been maintained negative and we've been able to successfully walk this off the farm. So just in a little bit of time that I have left, I'm going to talk through a couple of additional things that we've seen and how we've extended this to Brazil as well as to Vietnam.
So um, this project in Brazil started with a report by, um, by others that they had found Seneca virus in pig feed and feed ingredients in Brazil. And so that led us to conduct this case study where we knew that we had a farm that was affected with Seneca virus and we evaluated their farm as well as three feed mills and conducted biosecurity um, audits as well as collected um, well over 500 samples of ingredients, feed, and environmental swabs to try to understand if there is feed mill to farm contamination or farm to feed mill contamination and the potential role that the feed supply chain can play. The most important thing from the study is that no samples contained Seneca virus. By the time that those samples were shipped and arrived in the United States for analysis, there was no remaining Seneca virus. And so instead samples were analyzed for bacterial growth. Um, we uh, rated them on a semi-quantitative scale of zero to four with four being the most prolific bacteria growth. And we reported the, the three most dominant bacteria per sample. Again, we made these different mills um, and made these different maps that showed um, their biosecurity compliance. And so any red areas were areas where we had a high degree of bacterial growth. Um, orange would be a, a moderate level of bacterial growth. Yellow would be a low area of bacterial growth. And then green would be none, indicating a very clean hygiene. Feed mill A was by far our cleanest feed mill. They had locked entry doors, employees changed clothes and shoes, um, employees were washing their hands regularly, and the scale was within the fenced perimeter. But you can see the scale still had a decent amount of bacteria presence, as did um, trucks that were coming to and from the facility. One of our biggest challenges there is that the on-farm scale, even though it was within the, the fenced perimeter, was occasionally being used to weigh pigs and company-owned pigs. We see that a lot in the United States as well. Feed mill B was significantly dirtier. Um, it had an audit score of only 67%. Um, they were not locking entry doors. They didn't have hand washing. The scale was outside the perimeter. And that scale was routinely being used um, with, to weigh company-owned pigs. And then finally, feed mill C is the dirtiest mill. It had a, a biosecurity audit score of 42%, um, very similar to what the previous mill was, but that scale was used, to, was used to weigh animals, not just pigs, but animals from throughout the area routinely. Um, and it was not within the fenced perimeter. And so almost every surface that we collected in that feed mill um, had high degrees of bacterial growth, indicating very poor hygiene within that mill. Finally, to move on to African swine fever virus and to Vietnam, um, this is a facility that we began or a production system that we began to work with um, as K-State in August of 2019. And it's a relatively modern production system. They have pretty modern diets and they're located in the most pig dense region of Vietnam. To date, we have just under 2,500 samples that we've collected in an ongoing adaptive sampling strategy. And those include things like ingredients and complete feed, transportation, and production. The big important learning from this in Vietnam is that we have um, 900 total feed and ingredient samples that we've collected. Nine of the 900 have had positive ASF DNA, so about 1% positive rate in ingredients and feed, but none of those are in ingredients. All of them have been complete feed thus far. When we evaluate feed delivery vehicles, we have seven um, feed, seven PCR samples coming from, um, or seven positives coming from feed delivery vehicles. Um, and so what we've learned along the way to, to prevent or reduce the risk of those feed delivery vehicles is we need to be power washing and pressure washing to remove organic material. Then those trucks are dried and then we disinfect them. The interior of those surfaces are much more difficult. We continue to struggle with positives, with ASF positives from inside feed trucks. And so that's the um, focus of a current project funded by National Bork Board right now. The feed mills themselves have only had a couple of positives during this time between um, August and March. But from March to 2020, we've had um, hundreds of additional samples that have been analyzed. We've seen a greater prevalence of feed mill positive samples, but again, no positive ingredient samples. And so we believe what we're seeing in, in Af in, with African swine fever virus in Vietnam, at least within this production system, 
is that as we think about how feed mills, farms, and ingredient facilities are connected, many times we think about that contamination coming through feed. But in this case, we believe that we had a positive animal that then that contamination was picked up and brought back into a feed mill. There then lies the risk for the feed mill to be that transition point for subsequent risk and subsequent transmission to other farms that it services, therefore infecting those other farms. Of course, what would be the biggest risk if that contamination is carried back to ingredient facilities and ultimately contaminates ingredient facilities and subsequently other mills, farms, and production systems. And so instead of it being based on ingredient contamination at this point, we believe that we have feed-based transmission occurring, but really starting at the farm and occurring through the feed supply chain backward. So the major lessons that we've seen through these three different studies is that biosecurity is really about containment and exclusion. We have to think about them both. These transition zones in particular need frequent decontamination and prevention of contamination. Many times when we have an outbreak of a viral disease, we pay the most attention to pig contact areas, but we believe that non-pig contact areas are an important source of contamination as well and that they need to be monitored closely with something like this environmental monitoring. In our case, monitoring the environment was key to educate employees. I remember one of the most important lessons from our farms on at K-State was that um, one of the employees' desks at one point had a, a higher level of PEDV contamination than um, the farrowing crates did because we could clean and sanitize farrowing crates and that was part of the protocol, but we weren't cleaning and sanitizing their desks or underneath their desks. And so where we saw cross traffic, um, ultimately where they were eating their lunches, we saw the greatest contamination of PEDV on their desktops. Finally, what we've seen through a number of these different studies now is that ingredients are rarely the primary contaminant. Very rarely are they the, the source zero or the primary source where contamination begins. But instead, the feed system can be an easy route of secondary contamination and transmission. With that, I'd just like to thank you on behalf of the entire feed safety team. That's myself, Dr. Jordan Gebhardt, Chad Polk, and Jason Woodworth. If you're interested in these studies um, and more elaborate explanations of them, I encourage you to check out our website, kswine.org, and click on our feed safety resources link. Thank you. Our last speaker before the break is Dr. Scott D., who earned his DVM, Master's, and PhD from the University of Minnesota. Dr. D was a professor at the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine, where he studied the transmission and biosecurity of PERS. In 2011, Dr. D joined Pipestone Veterinary Services, where he currently serves as director of Pipestone Applied Research. Dr. D will talk to us about how feed mitigation strategies and holding times can help eliminate the risk of pathogen introduction via feed. Dr. D. Good morning, everybody. Ms. Scott D. at the SDC virtual seminar. I want to thank Monsi so much for the honor of joining you today, part of this great program. Uh, Carlos, you see there, he, uh, he and I are pretty tight. So I get a chance to honor Carlos a little bit today. So I'm really looking forward to it as well as share with you this topic. How can additives reduce the risk of pathogen uh, introduction via feed? So a little bit about Carlos. Uh, I think I met Carlos in 1982 when I was a, a master student at the University of Minnesota. So he passed in 2007. So I knew him a very long time. And when he passed away, a little bit of me passed away too. I'm sure a lot of you feel the same way. That's my favorite picture of him right there that I've used in several uh, other lectures. I gave the inaugural Pijuan lecture. And I think I had that on my cover slide too. If you know anything about Carlos, he was uh, extremely eclectic. He loved bird watching, woodworking, camera collection, he collected knives. You go to his house, you'd see all sorts of cool stuff. Art, he was a fanatical lover of Spanish art. But his real love of all was his grad students. Grad students were his number one passion at the University of Minnesota. Many of them had become leaders in the industry. Monsi, for example, 
Uh, Eduardo Fano, who I had a chance to co-advise with Carlos Jampolcano. I also co-advise with Carlos, uh, just, and many others, just leaders in the industry throughout the world. He was a great scientist, a great mentor, and a super friend. And he really helped me navigate my PhD. He was on my committee. And uh, as I was a faculty member at the university, he also helped me a lot. So the thing I remember most about Carlos, and I think the greatest gift he gave me was just intensity, especially intensity to publish. He was always wanting to be first to publish a new scientific finding. That was one of his drivers was to be first. And I have a lot of that same intensity that hasn't, hasn't waned. In fact, I think it's gotten, I think it's gotten worse. <laughs> anyway, and he also was very connected with the industry. And that's where kind of the SDEC, the Swine Disease Eradication Center, came from. Uh, the center was organized by Carlos and myself and the rest of our swine faculty in the early 2000s. There we are. And I got some, got some great people on that slide. It must have been about 2002, maybe, 2003, that picture. Of course, there's Bob and Peter and John and Carlos, Hansu, and Tom. So that's, I think we were, we were really smoking in those days. So the SDEC is an important thing. I'm glad it's still going. Monsi's been a great director. It's very active. Carlos would be very proud that his connection with the industry is alive and well. So uh, just a lot of history. There's so much history. And when you get my age, I'm a, almost 62. I've been in this profession for over 30 years. You just, a lot of history <laughs> comes and goes. And people like Carlos touch you and they, they never stop giving. All right, so let's get to the topic of the day. This is the publication that just came out on this topic of using uh, additives for mitigating the risk of virus contaminated feed using an ice block challenge model. We'll talk about it today. Carlos would have loved this study. He just would have loved this whole feed risk issue. He just would have been all over this with African swine fever virus. And obviously back in the PED virus days, Carlos would have just been all over this stuff, pushing, pushing, and pushing, and driving us to come up with uh, innovative ways to bring solutions for producers. He was so connected to the field. This is a pretty good example of what Carlos would have wanted us to do. And there's the, the co-authors you see. Uh, Dr. Megan Niederwer, my colleague from Kansas State University, who's been a big player in the whole feed risk arena. Roy Edler is a biostatistician from our team. He did all the stats for this paper. Dan Hansen's our director of daily research operations, basically managed the project with a lady named Jenna Schuld, who uh, oversees our BSL2. We'll talk about that. Aaron Singri is a virologist in Eric Nelson's laboratory at South Dakota State University. He helped me develop the ice block challenge we'll talk about. And there's Roger Cochran, our director of feed mills. Gordon Spronx, our, our chairman of the board in Pipestone. And uh, Eric Nelson, the great Eric Nelson from South Dakota State. So those are the uh, co-authors and co-investigators on this project. It's published in Transboundary and Emerging Diseases. You can see uh, in July. So it's available. It's open access. Take a look. I want to thank the supporters of the study. We got funding from several different places. This was a year and a half long project. It was a monster. But we got a lot of uh, funds from Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research, or FAR, uh, Swine Health Information Center, the Minnesota Board of Animal Health, and then you'll hear of several participating companies that were involved in this. As I sought companies to bring additives to the study, the, the, uh, the, the plan was, well, you can bring your additive, but you also have to bring some funds. And so everybody uh, paid the same amount. Everybody knew that all the results would be published in an open access peer reviewed journal. So company involvement, product involvement, inclusion rates, that was all part of the deal. That was going to get published. So that was something everybody knew ahead of time. The companies also had a chance to review the paper before we submitted it to Transboundary and Emerging Diseases. So they had a chance to, to comment on it and revise it, et cetera, if I had made some mistakes in my writing. Let's talk about it. 
one of the visions behind this project was I call it scale up. A lot of the work that had been done on feed additives as viral mitigants was done using lab-based projects. And there's nothing wrong with that. You have to start small sometimes to figure this out. So we'd have small amounts of feed, grams, basically. We'd have microliters of virus. We'd have a single bioassay pig that would get a one milliliter inoculum. So this was a very, very basic start, but it helped us screen uh, which products might be of, uh, of interest for this next phase, which I'll call, we'll utilize representative conditions. So we're gonna try to get bigger. We're gonna try to use larger numbers of pigs, greater tonnage of feed, a lot of different products with diverse chemistries. We really want to provide an options for producers and veterinarians. And so they could look at this list at the end of the study and say, well, this product is, uh, I can manage this one at my mill. It's got a good safety rating. It seems to work real well. I'm going to go this way. So options was important here. And then to, obviously to be very transparent, we had to be, we had to disclose all uh, potential conflicts of interest, as well as all companies and product names. The hypothesis was additives will improve performance. Very straightforward. So a little background on the methods. As I mentioned, this was a long study. It started in November of 2018. We finished it this year in February. We ran it in our BSL-2 facility, which is, was a new facility that uh, Pipestone Research constructed under the guidance of Dan Hansen. I'll show you a picture. But basically, this was a cool facility because we could have six rooms with independent air spaces, air filtered in and out, Danish entry. So we could have treatments and controls in side-by-side -side rooms without the risk of cross-contamination. We wanted to use a lot of pigs. So we're representative facilities, but also a lot of animals. So there were 96 pigs in a room. We almost used 3,000 total pigs. And each room had its own feed bin, which was essential because we are going to mix up feed with mitigants which would be treatments, and then we're going to have controls, which is feed that is non-mitigated in side-by-side -side rooms. Overall, we ran five experiments. Each experiment was 25 days. Pigs were on, on feed for 10 days pre-challenge and then 15 days post-challenge. I'll describe what we did there in a minute. We ended up testing 15 different products, some at different inclusion rates, which is cool. And then, as I mentioned, treatments, mitigated feed, controls, non-mitigated feed. Here are the participating companies and the products we tested. So take a little time here and look at this list. We'll go it down the list here real quickly. There's a few things I want to mention. So the first project we did involved Novus. Novus brought Activate DA. Uh, they're, they're a really nice product. Uh, we studied two different inclusions. We'll show you some data. Chemin came next with uh, three different products, uh, Salcurb. Uh, Salcurb K2, which is a non-formaldehyde product. It's usually uh, used in Asia more than the U.S. Cap to sure, two different inclusions. ADM brought several products, Dofit S and Dofit Plus, and looking at different inclusions as well. PMI brought a product called Dominate. Anatox Finio. Altec brought a product called Guardian. You see a red asterisk by that name. That is a, to disclose a conflict of interest. I helped develop that product. So there's an income stream there. We have to disclose that conflict. Feed Energy had an R2 liquid product, uh, fatty acid product. DSM, VVC. Provimi Vigilex. I've got Vigilex highlighted here as well because they, all these other companies paid for their research. Uh, Provimi decided not to. They didn't want to participate. But several uh, producer clients of ours wanted it tested. And so we recruited funds from the industry, from the production companies, to include Vigilex in the, in the testing. So just a, just a point there, I want to be clear that uh, Provimi did not fund their own project, product. And Pario, PH Force, El Ralco Dual Defender, and McNess First Protect. Now, rather than go through all the chemistry of each of these, uh, it's in the paper. But you could also talk to representatives from the company to get better details than I could probably give you. But if you know anything about these products, you'll see there's organic acids here, there's formaldehyde products, there's medium chain fatty acids, there's long and short medium chain blends, there's essential oils, there's prebiotic fiber, 
there's various acids, either individual or, or mixtures. So we really had a nice, uh, nice eclectic base of products, which is kind of was, if you remember, was one of our goals. We didn't want to just test one thing. We wanted to give people options. All right, so here's our BSL-2. You're looking at the facility. You see the six feed bins on the side. So the rooms are running uh, east to west across the building, just to get you uh, kind of you know, oriented. And uh, there's the building there. It's inside, upper right-hand corner is the shower in. You go down that clean hallway. Uh, and you see the silver doors on the side. Yeah, that's a door, one door to each room, the clean door. Then you exit that room with another door on the end of the room and you exit out a dirty hallway through another shower. So we, we go, as we circle between each of these rooms, we shower in and out of every room. So we took a lot of showers in the study. And there's a lot, just a picture at the bottom uh, right-hand corner of kind of how the rooms were set up. It's a great facility. Let's talk challenge. This was kind of a, a different way of doing things. I had the thought of if we have PERS virus, for example, or PED or Seneca surviving well during cold conditions, maybe the viruses are in, are in ice or they're in snow and maybe they're blowing around and they're getting in feed bins uh, and they're contaminating feed that way. They, you do get snow and ice in your feed bins. I didn't know that. Dan Hansen told me that. I didn't realize that, so okay. Well, let's make an ice block. So working with Eric Nelson again and Aaron Singri, I had the vision of let's take th all three of these viruses, Seneca, PERS, and PED. Seneca, you know, is a, a relative of foot and mouth disease virus that lives very well in feed. PERS, of course, you know, we picked 174, and PED, the original feed virus, probably how the virus entered the United States. Let's take equal quantities and volumes, as you can see laid out there. Let's mix it together. Let's balance the quantity of liquid to give us basically a one pound block of ice. So 454 milliliters, 454 grams, one pound. Eric and Aaron froze that at minus 80 in their lab. And then I got the blocks. I took them to the farm. I climbed up the ladder, opened up the lid of the bin, and on day zero and day six of the challenge period I dropped uh, block, uh, one block in each bin two different times so on day zero of the challenge period remember it was 15 days and on day six and then we just kind of let mother nature take over and we kind of let the ice blocks there you see them right there just kind of work their way into the feed so there you see looking down into the bin you see the feed uh, tonnage you see the blocks and, uh, and we just kind of let Mother Nature take over and the blocks would melt or they get chipped up by the auger and the feed would move into the room. We had no control over what happened at this point, but it was kind of a, a, kind of a very natural way to challenge feed, I thought. Once we uh, challenged, we started to measure and we measured several different ways. We measured uh, I'll call anti-mortem samples. Uh, we took Swiffer samples of the feeders. You can see that in the upper right hand corner. We wanted to determine whether there was a viral RNA in the feed. Okay, so did the viruses enter the room through the feed? So we would, we would take that sample. We took oral fluids, as you can see as well. We wanted to see if the pigs contacted the virus through the eating of the feed. So we looked to see whether there was RNA in the oral fluids. And we also measured clinical scores in the pigs to see if they got sick with signs of Seneca, PERS, or PED. At the end of the 15-day challenge period, we necropsied 30 of the 96 pigs, and we took the samples denoted on the slide. We took tonsil for Seneca, we took serum for PERS virus, and we took rectal swabs for PED virus to see if the pigs were viremic or infected or shedding. Uh, we wanted to see if the pigs got infected. Uh, did they actually have the virus within their bodies, not just in the oral cavity? Then we measured performance. We measured average daily gain and percent mortality. So a lot of samples were collected uh, throughout this 15-day challenge period. All right, what did we learn? I'm going to take you through five slides. going to show you the five experiments and show you the products there on the left side. You'll always have the products listed. You see the inclusion rates, and you'll see the positive control. Remember the positive control is non-mitigated feed. So everything's the same in that control room, except for the fact there's no mitigation. 
So here's a Activate DA and Activate DA at label 0.5%. And then they'd had, they had a reduced dose, about a, th a third of the dose. And you can see there were some differences. There were some differences in average daily gain. Again, in kilograms, you see significantly better average daily gain in Activate DA full dose than the reduced dose and control. And there's our mortality differences. We did see some numerical differences in mortality. So the label dose of DA did very, very well. Here came Kemen, as I mentioned. Kemen came next with uh, Salcurb at the label dose, as well as Captisher at the 1% dose. That's their current label dose as well. And then our control group. And again, you see significant improvements in average daily gain on the treatments as compared to the control and numerical differences in mortality. So those two products did extremely well. Experiment three, got, we got a little bigger now. People were hearing about this study and, and wanting to participate, and now we're filling the entire barn. We've got five rooms going on with treatments and then one control room. And you can see there's the ADM products, the Dofit S at two different inclusions. There's Dominate, the PMI product, Cellcurb K2. Again, that's a non-formaldehyde Cellcurb in uh, Asia, and then Finio. And you can see again, look how nicely those uh, treatments performed. Not, not, no difference between themselves, but significantly different than the positive control. So we're starting to see a pattern here that mitigation appears to have a benefit independent of product, which was kind of cool. Experiment four, same thing. There's VVC, uh, that's a benzoic acid product from DSM, if you remember. Uh, two different concentrations, R2. Captisher and Guardian. Captisher in the lower dose, Guardian on the label dose, and R2 on the label dose. And again, you see the same thing. Very different performance and very different mortality as compared to the positive control. Final experiment kind of showed the same thing. A uh, little bit different twist here, though. If you look at these mitigants, you got the five products, PHORs. Uh, DAFIT plus Dual Defender and First Protect all behaved similarly. They were all outstanding. Vigilax uh, didn't do anything. It was basically no difference in the positive control, as you can see there by the average state of gain data and the percent mortality data. So this was the first mitigant we picked up that appeared to be different than the other ones we tested. So I was I was happy that we that the model was sensitive enough to detect a product which was not functioning at the same level as others. So this was a very interesting observation. Now, if you put that all together and you do a meta-analysis on average daily gain, I'll credit Roy Edler here. He basically looked at all five experiments, the differences in mean of the treatment versus the control in each case in regards to growth rate, he did the stats, he put everything into a forest plot on the right, and you kind of see, if uh, you see all those black boxes on the right side of that zero line, that's indicating that the use of a mitigant has a beneficial positive effect on gain. Had something shown up on the left of that zero line, you could you see that then it would have favored the, the positive control or no mitigation. But we didn't see that at all. In every experiment we ran, mitigants, were advantageous as compared to non-mitigants, which was really one of the goals. We didn't really want to compare product A against B. I was more interested in mitigation, yes or no. What was the best thing to do? So let's close up uh, under the conditions of this study. Pigs demonstrated improved health and performance in mitigated feed versus non-mitigated. Now, I didn't show you any of the viral data that we collected from the the feed or from the oral fluids, so I just didn't have time, but there was very, you can read in the paper, there was numerical differences in the CT values in the treatment rooms versus the control room. The, the treatment uh, CT values were extremely weak. So the CT values were in the upper 30s, for example, of these viruses. Not so in the, uh, in the positive control room, the CT values were much stronger, indicating there could have been more virus, at least uh, semi-quantitatively speaking, in that in those control rooms we saw less clinical disease even though we saw uh, we could detect rna of any of these viruses in our treatment rooms in our pigs maybe on rectal swabs in a blood sample in a tonsil sample but we didn't see uh, the performance drag we didn't see the disease 
that the control pigs were experiencing. Remember those mortalities in those control rooms? You saw 5%, 7%, 10%. You saw the growth rate difference and uh, you know, just a healthier group of pigs on a mitigant. Even though the viruses were still there, the, the mitigants didn't sterilize the feed, but it, it, they somehow ameliorated the effect of the pathogen so the pig could handle it, either maybe reducing viral load or improving the immune response. I have no idea how, what the mechanism is. But it was very consistent. In 14 of the 15 products, we had great performance. One of the things to note here is we actually showed transmission of PERS virus in feed. I don't think that was ever published before. That was uh, the first such report. Every experiment we ran showed uh, the ability of PERS virus to move through the feed. So I think we have to pay attention to that. And I think we accomplished our goals. We scaled up. We tested a lot of products. We collected a lot of information. It's all in the publication. We have options for producers and veterinarians. Carlos always taught me to critique our work, so I will do that for you. Obviously, strengths and limitations. Uh, I think the challenge model was novel. It apparently was sensitive enough to pick up a non-performer. We had a diverse portfolio of, of chemistries, and we looked at, we took a lot of samples. We had multiple metrics, anti-mortem and post-mortem diagnostics to really understand what the viruses were doing, what the pigs were doing during the study. Now, the limitations. Uh, this, this challenge model doesn't always work. It, it definitely failed. Um, one time I remember it failed and we thought it was too warm outside. It was one of our conclusions. The feed was too warm. It was kind of an abnormal, seasonally abnormal warm November in one case and we didn't, it just bombed. So it doesn't always work. It looks real simple on these slides, but uh, it's, it's, it doesn't always work. Viral load of challenge. Remember, we did use 10 to the 5 per milliliter times 100 mils per virus. That could be construed as a lot of virus, and you wonder, is that realistic? We used that 10 to the 5 because that was the concentrations of PED virus we found in our original index cases back in January of 2014 when we published the first work in feet. So those were data from actual feed cases, field cases of feed contamination. But you know, if you look at 10 of the five, you spread that out over uh, per gram of feed, there's not a lot of virus there when you look at it that way. It's, uh, that's kind of an interesting way. Uh, Frederick Sandberg of uh, McNess kind of came up with that calculation. He goes, it's not really that much if you look at it on a per gram, so okay. And then the duration of post-challenge, well, 15 days, what would have happened if we would have gone longer? Maybe things would have changed, but at least under these conditions of the study, everything was, was quite consistent. So next uh, studies, uh, future studies and next steps. Um, you know, these mitigants here were used more as a preventative. What if you have pigs on mitigants and they get infected through another route? Say with PERS through an airborne event. Do the do the have the having the pigs on mitigants during acute disease challenge does that help? What's the mechanism of action? Can we dose titrate? Do we need full dose all the time? Can we can we use lower amounts? Obviously that would save that would save money. And then I think you know none of this really has an antiviral label claim. So companies are working now with the FDA to try to see what they can do to get this on label, which is would is definitely the right thing to do. So I complement companies but also FDA. FDA is trying really hard to accelerate the process. And I think one of the philosophies that are coming out of this work is from several leading practitioners, Tim Lola for example, he's publicly stated all sow herds in the U.S. ought to be on a mitigant of some type. We need a national program of feed biosecurity and looks like there are some products out there that can do a really nice job. So thanks to Tim on that. Last slide, I'll take you back to 1982 and show you some dearly beloved friends who have departed far too soon. This is probably about the time I met Carlos. So there he is on the right. There's Bob Morrison right there. That's Martha Fuentes, she's, uh, she's still here. I'm glad Martha hasn't left us. She's a great scientist. I think this is one of her uh, PhD oral exams or something, that's why she's there. And there's that layman. If a lot of people may never have met or seen Al Lehman, there's the old boy right there. Unfortunately, he's passed too. So if these these three guys were here today, boy, oh boy, would they be all over this, keeping ASF out of North America. It's ironic, we have an American, a Canadian, and a Mexican. Wouldn't they be great 
uh, pounding the podium, just saying, we got to work together. We got to do what we can to reduce this risk of fee. I think they would have just loved this topic and they would have been passionate about getting it in place in the field. So with that, I'm finished. I do appreciate again, the invitation from Monsi. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed a few of my stories about my dear mentor, Carlos. I miss him every day. I'll never forget him. I can't thank him enough for everything he did for me. And thanks to all of you. Have a good remainder of the conference. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dr. Lee, for your talk, and especially for that tribute to Dr. Carlos Pijuan. With that, we'll take a short 15-minute break. Thank you. Thank you.